John White stares at the sun-bleached skull. Empty eye sockets stare back. This was surely one of Grenville's men, but 15 stayed behind to hold the fort. Where were the rest of them? Governor White, one of the men speaks up. We should go. White nods, but go where? He's still rattled from the news he was given back at the ship, still trying to make sense of it. As they'd clambered into the boat to head to shore, the ship's pilot, Simon Fernando, had leaned over the railing. Leave the men on shore, he had yelled down in his thick Portuguese accent. You come back for the rest. White hadn't understood at first. They were only here to find Grenville's men. They were meant to sail on to the Chesapeake Bay farther north, to settle in a more accessible spot with friendlier native people. Summer is far spent, Fernando continued. I will land all the planters in no other place. They were stuck, it seemed, on Roanoke Island, stuck amidst hostile enemy territory. Hello, I'm Shayla Fontaine, and you're listening to History Fix. This is part two of a two-part episode about the Roanoke colonies. If you missed part one, head on back and listen to that now, and then rejoin me here. In our opening scene, the 1587 colony, led by Governor John White, has just arrived on Roanoke Island. But they weren't intending to stay. White, having witnessed the horrific downfall of the 1585 colony, knows Roanoke is a lost cause at this point. The plan, instead, was to take their 118 men, women, and children farther north to the Chesapeake Bay, where they hoped they would find more suitable land and more hospitable native neighbors. However, the ship's captain, Simon Fernando, had other plans. He claimed he needed to head back out in order to avoid hurricane season. Other theories suggest Fernando was antsy to hit up some of his favorite privateering spots in the Caribbean and basically ditched the colonists on Roanoke so he didn't miss out on the looting. Whatever the reason, the colonists are forced to disembark the ships and set up camp in known enemy territory. The 1585 colonists, under the leadership of Ralph Lane, burnt this bridge to the ground when they murdered the nearby Werowance, or leader, Pemisipan, formerly called Wingina. They know this. They are fully aware of this. And yet, here they are. So the odds are certainly against them. I asked Michael Oberg, distinguished professor of history at SUNY Geneseo University in Western New York, and author of the book, The Head in Edward Nugent's Hand, to explain. How do you think the choices that were made in, I guess, really 1586 affected the outcome of 1587? Oh, I think it doomed the 1587 colony on Roanoke Island. There, there was no question. Lane engaged in far more violence in counterproductive levels of violence that, that need not have been used. And even Harriet says that at the end of his account, is that there was too much violence in 1585 that, for causes that we should have, should have tolerated. And I think that's really the, 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 the great part of the story, is that it, it didn't need to end as badly as the 1585 colony ended. So what you have is this colony of 100 and some people planted on Roanoke Island in 1587, for reasons that don't don't make any sense, right? The story that they were dumped there makes no sense because the guy who dumped them hung around for quite a while. In any event, they're there and they have no friends. So let me just attempt to put this in perspective for you. These are not soldiers, rough, war-hardened men like in 1585. These are families, 14 families, including 17 women and 11 children. Two of the women were pregnant, one of whom was John White's own daughter, Eleanor Dare. They think they're going to the Chesapeake Bay, which they have been told is a utopian land with rich, fertile soil, plentiful food, agreeable weather, and hospitable neighbors, where they will be free to establish their own homestead and practice their religion however they see fit. This is what they signed up for, freedom and opportunity. What they got instead was a tiny, inaccessible, mosquito-ridden island with poor soil, experiencing the worst drought in almost a millennium, and a settlement that had obviously been destroyed in some kind of brutal, violent attack by their neighbors, who very much wanted them all dead. 
Is that the kind of world you'd want to birth a baby into? I can't even imagine. In reality, the experience of having a child in the new world would have been quite horrific. That's my sister Hannah West. The first chapter of her book, Remarkable Women of the Outer Banks, focuses on Eleanor Dare and the overwhelming obstacles she faced as she prepared to enter motherhood on Roanoke Island in 1587. In writing my chapter on Eleanor Dare, I wanted to examine what it would have been like for her as a mother. Um, They had a three-month ocean voyage. They arrived um, on Roanoke Island in July, when she was approximately eight months pregnant. So, I mean, I can only imagine. It's, you know, close to 100 degrees in July. The humidity is just absolutely oppressive. She's arriving to a place where there is no established settlement or colony, and she's expected to bring her new child into the world here. Um, No medical help of any kind other than who might have been on board with her. So just the conditions of not only having to carve out a life for yourself, but to bring a new life into this place, it just would have been a a terrifying prospect. I was pregnant with my second child when I was writing this chapter on Eleanor Dare. And so I think that really helped me to get into the headspace of what was it like for this woman? You know, these were families that came over here um, under hostile and untenable conditions, although they were told otherwise, you know, and who was telling her story? You know, she was being used as a vessel for England to glorify England and their, their stake and their claim on the new world. And we've had a child here. So we're, you know, we're spreading our population in this new world. But what was it like for the humans that were being used to accomplish this? And for this woman, um, who was, really had no avenue to tell her story. Her father, John White, the governor of the colony, kept detailed journals. Um, Ralph Lane from the previous colony kept detailed journals, but we have no surviving record from her or the other women or children or indigenous people that were all a part of this story. So to look back and piece together what we can about what it must have been like for them, I think is really important. Just a few days after arriving and setting to work rebuilding the destroyed settlement, disaster struck. A colonist named George Howe was killed as he searched for crabs and shellfish in the sound. He had wandered around two miles away from Fort Raleigh, where he was easy pickings for Pemisipan's people who still wanted revenge. Here's historical reenactor Bill Ray reading John White's account of this encounter. These savages, being secretly hidden among high reeds, where off time they find the deer asleep and so kill them, espied our man wading in the water alone, almost naked, without any weapon save only a small forked stick, catching crabs therewithal, and also being strayed two miles from his company, and shot at him in the water where they gave him sixteen wounds with their arrows. After they had slain him with their wooden swords, fled over the water to the main. So George Howe doesn't come back. They go to find him, and they find him full of arrows with his skull bashed in. Right after they reoccupy the site, a a guy named George Howe, one of the leaders of the colony, was was killed by Indians, presumably by Juan Chase, we're told, but he was... He was hit by some like a hundred arrows. It wasn't just one chase. This was, you know, he was he was ambushed and knocked off by people who didn't want any English people on the island. This is clearly a message from those who were loyal to Pemisipan. White has to figure something out. He has to fix this. They can't rely on the Roanokes for food like they did last time, and they can't be self-sufficient if they can't leave their fort without being killed. He turns to Mantio, who is still with them, and he's like, hey, you still like us for some strange reason. Maybe your people will still like us too. (laughs) Because Mantio is not a Roanoke like Juan Chis. He's a Croatoan. The Croatoans live on the barrier islands, mainly on modern-day Hatteras Island, which is farther south. Mantio's mother is a Werowanza of the Croatoans, a leader. So they head south with Mantio to try to gain some allies there. When they arrive, the people are immediately defensive. They seem ready to attack. The Croatoans had never been intentionally provoked by the English, but some of them had been accidentally killed during that attack on Pemisipan's village when he was beheaded by Edward Nugent. So they're a little salty about that still. 
So they're readying their bows and arrows. They are not receiving the English peacefully. And then Mantio calls to them in their own language, and they stop, drop their weapons, and embrace him. They didn't recognize Mantio. He wore English clothing at this point. They didn't even recognize him until they heard him speak. So John White sits down with the Croatoan leaders, thanks to Mantio, and he asks them to help him reestablish peace with the rest of the indigenous groups. He wants the Croatoans to send the others a message to come meet him on Roanoke Island at a predetermined time so they can sort it all out and figure out how to coexist peacefully. The Croatoans are hesitant, but they agree to send the message. They also agree to peace with the English on the condition that the English don't ask them for any of their corn. (laughs) They barely have enough for their own people. This truly is the worst drought in 800 years. Core samples taken from very old trees in the area confirm this. White's like, okay, okay, we won't ask for any corn. Your corn is safe. Just help us make peace with the others. There was no way that colony was going to feed itself or sustain itself there. You you can see this in John White sort of fumbling around the region, trying to get help and provisions and supplies. That the only people who are willing to help them at all are Manteo's people. Manteo, another one of these indigenous people who went to England in 1584, but unlike Juan Chase, remained with the English his entire life. They're the only ones interested in tolerating the English, and even they they are keeping them at arm's length, right? They ask for some kind of emblem or something that they can wear so that they can be distinguished from, from other Indians who the English are prone to attack. It's here from the Croatoans that they learn what happened to the 15 men Grenville had left behind. Juan Chis and some of his men had attacked them and set fire to the fort, forcing them to flee. Some were killed, trying to run away. The others piled into a rowboat, crafted a sail out of their clothing, and foolishly headed out to sea where they most likely drowned. So the day of John White's peace meeting comes and goes, and no one shows up. They don't give White and his pleas for peace the time of day. Now the English are mad. They feel slighted. And I'll never understand this next move because it seems a complete 180 from this little peace party he was trying to have, they decide to attack Dasamunkapiak to get revenge for the 15 men Wanchis had killed, which seems real dumb. They kill Pemisipan, Wanchis killed their men, they're even, why keep it going? But I think it all goes back to that English fear of treachery that Michael mentioned in part one. The English were very afraid of treachery. And to some extent, this is, there's a lot of projection going on with this. But they they feared that if you didn't stop a problem right away, it would grow grow larger. And the way to stop most problems for the English was 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 through violence. I mean, that that was the measure of your strength. Well, this attack gets even dumber. Unfortunately, they roll up on Dasamunkapiak, ready to take down the Pemisipan Avengers, Wanchis supporters. They attack and kill a bunch of indigenous people, but then realize far too late that these were not their enemies. These were Croatoans, Mantio's people, basically their only allies. They accidentally killed the Croatoan Werowans, Minotoan, and a bunch of other important Croatoans. It's a horrific mistake to make. Mantio has to be just beside himself. These are his people, his family. He tries to rationalize it. He's like, well, if they'd just come to the peace meeting, this wouldn't have happened. But y'all, he's grasping at straws. They straight up mistook their allies for enemies and killed their only friends on the islands. It's whack. They head back to Fort Raleigh like, okay, let's just lay low. Pretend that never happened. It's fine. It's going to be fine. And now I'm just picturing them getting back to the fort and everyone's like, how'd it go? And White's just like, ah, uh, that could have gone better. And Mantio is just like shook. Sorry to make light of a really tragic event, but holy cow, what an epic fail that was. On August 18th, White's daughter, Eleanor, gives birth to a baby girl and names her Virginia. And this is significant because Virginia Dare was the first English child born in the Americas, the first baby of English descent. And if you visited the Outer Banks, Roanoke Island, you know this is a big deal. It's like our claim to fame, that and the Wright brothers, of course. 
This event, the birth of this baby, has been mega glorified throughout history like she's the second coming of Christ or something. It's all very Eurocentric. But anyway, it had to have breathed a bit of new life into the colony, which was clinging to survival at this point. Very soon after this, Simon Fernando is ready to sail back to England. So it's been a month, roughly, since they arrived. Like, dude, if you can putter around for a month making repairs and such, surely you can squeeze in a quick trip up to the Chesapeake. It's not that far, but whatever. So the ships are about to set out. They're about to be really and truly stuck here. They accidentally killed their friends. This is where we're at. The colonists start demanding that John White return to England with the ships to get more supplies. They can't feed themselves here. They don't know how to grow corn in a drought, and they sure as heck can't ask the Croatoans for corn. They basically force White to return to bring back provisions. White does not want to go. He doesn't want to leave his daughter and granddaughter, for one. But honestly, in his journal, he's more concerned about leaving his stuff behind. Because they had made a plan to move, quote, 50 miles further up into the main, which would put them somewhere near the Choan River. White worries that his personal belongings will be left behind or destroyed in the move and that he will be, quote, forced to provide himself of all such things again or else at his coming again to Virginia find himself utterly unfurnished. Which, who cares? But that's what he's going with. Despite his hesitation, he does sail back to England with Fernando, but he plans to return as soon as humanly possible with more supplies. But when he finally arrives in England, late after a rough journey, he learns that his country is preparing for war with Spain. Queen Elizabeth I proclaims that no ships, no boats, no seafaring vessels should be used for any other purpose but defense against the fearsome Spanish Armada, which is basically an army of ships that the Spanish are pretty well known for at this point. Elizabeth has to defend the English Channel, and she needs all the ships in the whole country, apparently, to do this. White and Raleigh are begging her for a ship to resupply the colony, but months turn into years as the war wages on. In 1588, White manages to get his hands on two penances, which are like smaller sailboats. But they are attacked by a larger French ship on the way and, badly injured, have to flee back to England. He doesn't manage to get his hands on more ships until 1590. We're talking three years after he left the colony behind on Roanoke Island. The voyage back is super treacherous. One of the ships capsizes trying to pass through an inlet into the sound and seven men drown. So they are shook already at this point. They see a big pillar of smoke coming from the north end of Roanoke Island, where the settlement was. So White's probably like, oh, thank God, they're still there. They head that way, rowing up the sound. They sound a trumpet. They're singing English songs, jubilantly announcing their return. But they're met with silence. When they arrive on the island on August 18th, his granddaughter Virginia's third birthday, yeah, chills, there's no one there. The fire they saw just started naturally lightning or something they head up the beach toward the fort before they reach it carved into a tree are the letters c-r-o they get to the fort carved into one of the posts of the palisade is the word croatoan white had to have been relieved he knows where they are now before he left they had agreed that if the colonists were to leave roanoke island they would carve the name of the place they were going If they left in distress, they would carve a cross above the name of the place. There is no cross. The houses had been carefully disassembled and carried with them. There was no sign of a struggle or violence. There are no bodies. White breathes a sigh of relief. Here's what he wrote in his journal of that discovery. But we found the houses taken down and the place very strongly enclosed with a high palisade of great trees with court knives and flankers very fort-like, and one of the chief trees or posts at the right side of the entrance had the bark taken off, and five feet from the ground, in fair capital letters, was graven Croatoan, without any cross or sign of distress. I greatly joyed that I had safely found a certain token of their safe being at Croatoan, which is the place where Mantia was born, 
and the savages of the island, our friends. It did seem as though Wan Chi's men had returned to the settlement after the colonists left, though. They had dug up a chest of White's belongings that he had buried before he left and dumped it, ruining most of his things. So there you go. The very thing he was afraid of. He was overly concerned about his stuff. Although when he had fled Roanoke with Sir Francis Drake back in 1586, he had been forced to throw many of his things overboard to lighten the load. So, I mean, there there's some pre-existing trauma there, I guess. So White thinks he knows where the colonists are. They told him themselves they headed down to Hatteras Island to seek refuge with the Croatoans, who were Mantio's people, and maybe, possibly still accepted them despite the accidental slaying of their leader and them begging for corn after they promised they wouldn't. So end of story, right? Where's the mystery? Well, White attempted to head down to where the Croatoans lived to find the colonists, confirm their whereabouts, of course. But he was never able to get to them. Basically, a series of storms blew their ships back and back and back until they were forced to turn around and head back to England. And I don't know why every single time they decide to come to Roanoke Island, it's like August, which is hurricane season. Can we just have one single voyage not during a hurricane, guys? I know meteorology has come a long way, but still, they had to have been picking up on those weather patterns. Anyway, White wants to keep trying to look for them, but the crew basically overrules him. They already lost seven men on their way in, remember? And this is the graveyard of the Atlantic. He has no choice but to sail back to England, abandoning his daughter, his granddaughter, his colony to their mysterious fate. Mysterious to us, anyway. When White and his men pulled their boat up on that sound beach near Fort Raleigh, there were fresh footprints in the sand. Someone had just been there, someone who likely knew exactly what happened to the colonists, who could confirm whether they did indeed go to Croatoan or possibly somewhere else, 50 miles into the main, perhaps, as they had been planning, whether they were alive, whether they were dead. The indigenous people likely knew exactly what happened to the lost colonists of Roanoke. It was no mystery to them. But in our Eurocentric view of history, they are lost, disappeared, a mystery. We're left piecing together the clues to try to unravel that mystery. White failed to confirm that the colony moved south with the Croatoan. Though, based on the carving back at Fort Raleigh, it seems that's what at least some of them attempted to do. Whether they succeeded or not is unknown, but there is some evidence to suggest that they made it. When English explorer John Lawson visited the Outer Banks in 1701, he encountered a small group of indigenous people just 60 to 80 people living on Hatteras Island. These descendants of the Croatoan called themselves the Hatteras Indians and told Lawson, quote, several of their ancestors were white people and could talk in a book as we do. The truth of which is confirmed by gray eyes being found frequently amongst these Indians and no others, end quote. So if this account is true, It seems at least some of the colonists did make it to Hatteras and assimilated with the Croatoans living there. Archaeological excavations have revealed eight Croatoan villages on the sound side of Hatteras Island near the present-day town of Buxton. They also found a metal sword hilt and a signet ring. The ring especially was a very exciting find at the time. It was originally thought to belong to a colonist listed as Master Kendall because it had a little lion engraved on it, and that was the Kendall family crest or whatever. But further analysis of the ring has proved it's actually made of brass, not gold as originally thought, and was likely just a cheap trade good traded with the Native Americans long after the colony disappeared, and it eventually made its way to Hatteras. Plus, Kendall was part of the 1585 colony, not the 1587 colony, so that doesn't really prove anything other than trade anyway. It's not like Kendall left it there himself, so it it really proves nothing. But there are other plausible theories as well. One not very likely theory is that they were found and killed by the Spanish, who were their number one enemy at the time and actively at war with their homeland. But if this happened... It just seems like there would be some record of it. The Spanish would have recorded this event in some way that we likely would have discovered by now. Also, the settlement was carefully disassembled and there was no cross carved above the word Croatoan. They were clearly not in distress, not being attacked when they left by Algonquian or Spanish or anyone. 
Another theory is that they moved 50 miles west into the mainland, which was, of course, the plan they had made before White returned to England. That would put them somewhere up the Choan River at the head of the Albemarle Sound, near where the Choanoic people lived. If you recall from part one, Ralph Lane had paid a not very friendly visit to the Choanoics, where he temporarily abducted their leader, Minotonin, and took his son, Skyco, captive. And yet they somehow ended up being sort of allies with the Choanoic, despite all of that, possibly just because they had a common enemy in Pemisipan. It's complicated, but it's not crazy to think that the group made their way to the Choan River and established a settlement near the Choanoics. In 1937, an unnamed tourist driving through eastern North Carolina discovered a strange stone on the eastern shore of the Choan River. There was writing carved into the stone, and it appeared to be very old. He took it with him and eventually handed it over to Dr. Haywood Pierce at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. They were stunned with this discovery. Someone had carved a cross into the stone above the words, Ananias Dare and Virginia went hence unto heaven, 1591. Okay, so Virginia Dare, we know her. Ananias Dare was Eleanor's husband, Virginia's father. The back of the stone reads, Father, soon after you go for England, we came hither. Only misery and war two year. Above half dead here two year more from sickness being four and twenty. Salvage with message of ship unto us. Small space of time, the affright of revenge ran all away. We believe it not you. Soon after ye savages feign spirits angry, sudden murder all save seven. Mine child, Ananias too, slain with much misery. Bury all near four miles east this river upon small hill. Names writ all there on rock. Put this there also, salvage show this unto you, and hither we promise you to give great plenty presents. E.W.D. E.W.D. being, of course, Eleanor White Dare. So this is huge, if it's real, because you see, it's not the only Dare stone that was found. Over the next few months, 46 more Dare stones were found, mostly in South Carolina and Georgia, and these were all determined to be fake, a hoax. But the original dare stone found near the Choan River has not been definitively disproven as fake. It could still possibly be authentic. Although it is a little weird that it just happened to be discovered in 1937, around the time of the 350th anniversary of Virginia Dare's birth, when the topic was trending, so to speak. This is also the year Paul Green's Lost Colony Outdoor Drama began on Roanoke Island, and President Franklin D. Roosevelt gave a speech before the opening night show. So there was a lot of buzz already when the stone was found. I find that a bit too convenient. What are the chances? So I don't know that I would consider the Dare Stone hard evidence. It's, it's too sketch. But the theory itself is solid. You know, John White leaves to go home to England, and he when he returns finally three years later, he believed that they were 50 miles up into the interior. Um, he says that quite clearly. He, there was no mystery in his mind where the lost colonists went. They went up upstream. And who were those communities? Those were the communities that were telling Ralph Lane, well, it's not us. It's the it's Bamisipan who's conspiring against you. It was, it was those people who seemed more willing to tolerate an English presence. So the likelihood is that they had to abandon the Roanoke site where they were unwelcome and they moved upriver. And with the recent discovery of, of the image of the map underneath the patch on one of John White's maps, it appears that that's probably what, what they did. So let's talk about that map. In 2012, a map of the area created by John White called the Virginia Pars map was re-examined by the British Museum where it resides. And they made a surprising discovery. The First Colony Foundation made this official announcement in May of 2012, quote, 
Portions of a unique late 16th century map in the British Museum, which documents voyages to North America for Sir Walter Raleigh, have recently been examined to reveal hitherto unseen lines and symbols that have been hidden for centuries. Using a variety of non-contact scientific methods carefully chosen to be safe to use with early paper, researchers at the British Museum in London are peering at and through two small patches of paper applied to an Elizabethan map of parts of modern eastern North Carolina and Tidewater, Virginia. The first patch, number one, at the southern end of the map, appears to have been applied primarily to allow the artist to alter the coastline. The second patch, number two, at the northern end of the map, offers even more exciting finds. It appears to cover a large fort symbol in bright red and bright blue and has a very faint, just barely visible to the naked eye, but much smaller version of a similar shape on top. There is also a red circle under the patch that may represent an Indian town, end quote. So we have a fort symbol and a symbol marking an indigenous town, both covered up with a patch right where the Albemarle Sound meets the Choan River. And the patch itself is pretty obvious. I'm, I'm really not sure why they waited until 2012 to try to figure out what was under the patch. All they did was expose it to light, like put it on a light box, basically. So yeah, I don't know why that took 425 years. But the fort symbol is significant. It suggests that the English really may have attempted to resettle 50 miles into the Maine near an indigenous town. Or maybe it was just John White imagining where they might have settled if they had gone 50 miles west. You know, he covered it up. So was there a fort there or not? Why did he draw it? Why did he cover it up? It's an interesting clue, but it doesn't really confirm anything. What might, though, is future archaeological excavations at that site. The archaeological work being done at that that fort site um, at the head of the Albemarle Sound is really promising and exciting, and, and that will give us all kinds of answers. The location of White's hidden fort symbol is referred to as Site X. It's basically a finger of mainland that juts out into the Choan River at Salmon Creek in Bertie County, and it's approximately 55 miles from Roanoke Island, so basically exactly where they said they would go. Recent excavations at that site have uncovered Algonquian artifacts, but also some very good evidence of an early English presence there. English artifacts found there include a three-inch aglet, which covered the end of a 16th century shoelace, a snapuan's firing pan, which is a type of flint lock, and pieces of North Devon plain baluster jars, which were used to preserve food during the sea voyage. They were canning jars. But all of these could have reasonably made their way to an indigenous village without the actual presence of English there. The find that really has people convinced is a pottery shard. Not indigenous pottery, which is everywhere. It's a specific piece of pottery from England, a piece of Surrey, Hampshire, English border wear. Apparently, the English supplier of this specific type of pottery changed in 1620, making it easy to distinguish between pre-1620 border wear and post-1620 border wear. Now, for me, I'm like, okay, it's pre-1620, but so is Jamestown. Couldn't this have been traded with Jamestown settlers to the north and just found its way down? Well, according to Clay Swindle, an archaeologist with the Museum of the Albemarle, it isn't likely that the border wear was traded. Native Americans had their own pottery, tons of it. They were more interested in finished metals and glass beads, not something they could easily make themselves. This means that that small shard of pre-1620 border wear was most likely left by English settlers at Site X. It's the hardest evidence we have. There are also witness accounts of white people in this area, just like on Hatteras Island. When John Smith arrived in coastal Virginia to establish Jamestown 20 years later, he learned from the Powhatan that there were men clothed like himself living farther south. A Jamestown colonist named George Percy reported seeing a light-skinned child with blonde hair in one Powhatan community. Some of these eyewitness accounts also suggest that the Roanoke colonists were met with violence, likely at the hands of the Powhatan, possibly near the Chesapeake Bay or farther south at Site X. According to reports by chronicler Samuel Purchase, 
Chief Powhatan admitted to John Smith, quote, that he had been at the murder of that colony and shooed to Captain Smith a musket barrel and a brass mortar and certain pieces of iron which had been theirs. But, you know, Powhatan had reason to lie about this. If you listen to episode 24 about Pocahontas, you know the Powhatan were in open conflict with the Jamestown settlers. They did not want them there, and if they could appear more intimidating and fearsome and deadly to the English, it would only help them drive the English off, which they very much hoped to do. Michael called this using scary stories to rid themselves of these malevolent English invaders. So I think when you consider all the evidence, it's actually quite clear what happened to the Roanoke colonists. They went exactly where they said they were going to go. They went 50 miles into the main to site X, which was the plan they'd made with White before he even returned to England. And then I think some of them at least went with Manteo to live with the Croatoans on Hatteras Island, which is why Croatoan was carved into the Palisade Post. In both places, they would have assimilated with the native people living there, the Choanoic to the west or the Croatoan to the south. These are both groups that we know they had at least somewhat friendly relations with. Eventually, their, their, their implements would break, their clothing would wear out, and they'd start wearing what people in the country wore. And, and their material culture, too, would have changed in ways that they would start looking like the people they were living with. at least their their material culture would would look like what they were the people they were living with i agree with michael after enough years had passed there would be nothing english left to find aside from that pottery shard and a, a piece of an old shoelace they weren't english anymore they intermarried and interbred with the indigenous people and gradually accepted their way of life they had become really and truly carolina algonquian So why the question mark? Why the insistence on this mystical, fantasy-like mystery of the lost colony of Roanoke? Well, if you look at it through the very Eurocentric lens that pretty much all of history is told through, people have been very resistant to the idea of assimilation. They would rather believe that the colonists were massacred, horrifically slaughtered by the brutal, violent, devil-worshipping indigenous people than that they simply decided to join the natives and adopt their culture and customs. Because you see, that wasn't the plan. That's the opposite of the plan. They were supposed to infiltrate this civilization, set up their own better Christian civilization, and force the indigenous people to assimilate with them. They were supposed to turn the natives English and not the other way around. This attitude is obvious in the words of Joseph Blount Cheshire, an Episcopal bishop in North Carolina, who in 1911 said, quote, Never let anyone persuade you to believe for one moment that a colony of 118 Christian English people, men and women, husbands and wives, parents and children, an organized Christian community, your kinsmen and mine, were within the short space of no more than 20 years from 1587 to 1607 when the Jamestown settlement was made, swallowed up and amalgamated with half-naked heathen Indian savages, so that no remnant was left which could be recognized by their white brethren of Virginia. The Roanoke colony had been exterminated by Indians, and so they were. He concluded with this statement, quote, The descendants of those first Christian inhabitants of our land are not to be sought in the mongrel remnants, part Indian, part white, and part Negro, of a decaying tribe of American savages. End quote. So, yeah, a little bit resistant to the idea of assimilation in the most horrifically racist way possible. Why is it always Christians making horrible, hate-filled statements like this? I don't understand. It's the exact opposite of what the religion preaches, and it's a really bad look. Now, this was 1911. I like to think we're past this. But it's this attitude that has helped to twist the Roanoke colony into the mysterious lost colony. On the north end of Roanoke Island, you'll find Fort Raleigh National Historic Site. 
There they have a recreation of the earthwork fort built by the 1585 colony and a small museum with some artifacts that have been unearthed there. But it's likely the site of the actual settlement is now underwater as the sound has encroached on the island, swallowing more and more of the coastline over the last 400 years. It doesn't really matter, though. You won't find them there anyway. They were forced to leave, forced to retreat. That has been viewed as a tragedy, a misfortune, ever since. But there's another lens with which to view this story we have mostly neglected to consider. Whatever happened to them, whatever the mystery of the lost colonists actually is, and the same goes with 1585 and 1584. So whatever happened to these English colonists, whatever experience, those experiences were, were largely determined by indigenous people. And that Roanoke really is an indigenous story, right? We have so many stories of Europeans arriving and Indians retreating, of, of, of Indians always losing. And God knows there's loads of suffering, even in this story as well. But in this one, they win and they prevail. And it's the Europeans who go home. And they held the island. Thank you all so very much for listening to History Fix. I hope you found this story interesting and maybe you even learned something new. A huge, huge thank you once again to Professor Michael Oberg, author of the book The Head in Edward Nugent's Hand. Hannah West, author of Remarkable Women of the Outer Banks. I have links to purchase both of these books in the show notes, by the way. And Bill Ray for sharing their knowledge and talents with us. Be sure to follow my Instagram at History Fix Podcast to see some images that go along with this episode and to stay on top of new episodes as they drop. I'd also really appreciate it if you'd rate and follow this podcast on whatever app you're using to listen. That'll make it much easier to get your next fix. Information used in this episode was sourced from The Head in Edward Nugent's Hand, Remarkable Women of the Outer Banks, Coastal Land Trust, the First Colony Foundation, Smithsonian Magazine, and the National Park Service. Links to all of these sources can be found in the show notes, along with those links if you're interested in purchasing The Head and Edward Nugent's Hand or Remarkable Women of the Outer Banks.